want to. Okay. Makes it easy to ask questions. Um, right. So uh, this is Math 306. This is linear algebra two. I'm Dr. Ryan Tully Doyle. I joined the department uh, last year, although this is my third quarter teaching on campus. Although I went to school here, so uh, it's sort of exciting to be back. Um, I got a pretty good handle on on the, the quality and type of student that uh, exists at Cal Poly. So this class is uh, an extension of 206, but extension is kind of the wrong word because basically 206 is about uh, uh, matrices. I don't know if you guys got the impression that 206 is, is about anything else, but you know, after you do endless computations of determinants and eigenvalues and vectors and bases and Gram-Schmidt orthogonalizations, you get the idea that all linear algebra is is a pile of square numbers that you do computations on, right? So basically, we're doing this class. We're going to pretend matrices don't exist for chapters. So there's not going to be matrices for a long time. 306 is about maps between vector spaces. And the tool that we're going to use to talk about math between vector spaces, the main tool is this is a proof based class. So we're kind of starting from the beginning. Um, we're taking a completely different perspective than uh, the 206 text, which is very computational. And instead, we're going to be uh, proving that the main ideas of linear algebra work and the concepts that are behind them. And this is important because, I mean, there's a couple reasons this is important. The first is that. Uh, 248 is a great class, but it doesn't really have a lot of mathematical content. Like, here's what a proof is and how it works. And the second is 206 has a lot of great content, but it restricts itself to Rn. And then it thinks that everybody is computational mathematician. And the way that linear algebra gets used in practice is not always in terms of matrices on R3, for example. So linear algebra, this class is awesome. Linear algebra is great. Linear algebra, more than any, I'm going to try to convince you. I try to convince my 206 classes this as well. Linear algebra is the sort of universal language of math. So basically, every modern field of mathematics is constituted in linear algebra, all of it. Calculus is built in linear algebra, analysis is built in linear algebra, algebra is built in linear algebra to a, a kind of an alarming extent. Um, although not surprisingly, uh, combinatorics is built in linear algebra. Linear algebra sort of unifies like the different fields of mathematics. It's a really important and useful subject to study. And also, it gives us a nice self-contained subject that we can use to practice how to write mathematical proofs as a mathematician writes proofs and not as a learning student beginning uh, a Math 248 class comes out the other side. So we're going to be going beyond things like basic set conclusions and the structure of functions in here. So as a as a class, this class, I think the most important thing to do in this class, my thrust when I when I look at this, is to think of this class as uh, I want to practice writing. I'm going to put a lot of focus on the writing of mathematics because mathematics is no mathematics isn't good unless you can communicate what it is that you what you've discovered. So I'll point out that in the writing of mathematics and the book that we're going to use, I will explain the ridiculous title in a second. So the books we're going to use that focuses on the writing of math mathematics is by Axler, and it's called, it has the absurd title, Linear Algebra Done Right. Okay. So. The first thing that Axler does, so you might ask, okay, well, that's, that's, a, that's a preposterous title. How could, what could be right about linear algebra? How arrogant for him to assume this is the right way. So there's a, there's a couple of things he means by this. The, the biggest one is that he hates, he, he actually, I, know, I mean, I know him, but he hates determinants with his passion. He hates determinants. The determinants, we're not going to see a single determinant in this class. Determinants don't even show up in the book until the end of the last chapter because he needs them to prove something. Right? So there's no determinants. Um, the second thing is that he very much is interested, like I said, on, in studying these maps between vector spaces instead of matrices. So um, 
actually, his uh, a friend of ours, a guy named Sergey Trail, if you've looked at this book, wrote a counter book called Linear Algebra Done Wrong, which is all about matrix theory. So if you're so you with me that these guys are contesting with each other. But the upshot of like, th this particular text is it is written to be read. So if you haven't dealt with, if you're sort of coming into your first class in, uh, and a lot of you are coming into your first class in sort of these proof-based upper division mathematics classes, one of the big adjustments that you need to make is that these books need to be read, right? And that's actually a place where I know that the, the PDF file for this is free, right? It's on Springer link, you can you get online. This book is meant to be read. So I am not going to be able to say everything that needs to be said in the course of a 50 minute period four times a week, right? There's going to be an obligation that you have to go back when you've done our, with our discussions about what's going on in here to go read this book and really sort of bathe yourself in the, in the, in the language of it, right? It's not a, it's not like a, those of you that take an analysis, it's not like a Rudin type text where you're fighting to understand every single sentence in the book. It's written to be digested and, and it should be. Um, this class does take, you know, to get a handle on abstract ideas in upper division mathematics takes some time. There's a, a famous quote by, um, I don't know if you guys know who uh, John von Neumann is. But von Neumann is one of the like premier uh, uh, founders of quantum physics, right? So he built quantum physics and he built uh, all of infinite dimensional linear algebra, which is what I do for a living. And at some point, one of his graduate students asked him, um, uh, if he really understood quantum physics or this like infinite dimensional operator space, and he said, and von Neumann's apocryphal response was, nobody understands it, we just get used to it, right? And that's the basic idea of here. We're going to be dealing with ideas that are going to be kind of uncomfortable, and you might have the impression that working mathematicians, you know, like people who do this for a living, just understand everything there is. And uh, really, it is really much more the case that we just kind of get used to the idea that these things are abstract and unknowable and that we can mash the ideas around, right? And the only way that you're gonna get comfortable like that is to read the book and think about what it is that you're doing. So that leads me to the next point. The obvious flaw in teaching Axler, and there is one, is that Axler's solutions to this book are everywhere. Axler's solutions and everybody, this book is so widely used that basically explicit solutions to the problems in this text um, are all over the internet, as well as all over places like Stack Exchange and, and everything else. I'm going to strongly, strongly uh, encourage you to stay away from looking at other people's solutions to this book, right? One, because I know they exist, and I don't want to read other people's solutions. That's not useful. It's better <coughs> for you in this class when you're dealing with these ideas. Like the work has sort of been struggling with it. And if you just read somebody else's solutions, you do the thing that I did when I was a student where it's like, I don't really understand what's going on. Oh, I don't, I told him. I, I, I would have thought of that in three hours and I just write the solution. Right? So to the best of your ability, stay away from like looking at the extensive, uh, I'm sp thinking specifically of Chegg here where like there's just a textbook with a complete latex up <laughs> solution manual for the book, right? I know those exist. I know what they look like. Don't copy the work of a graduate student desperate for beer money, right? Which is what that is, um, right? Really work with this because getting a solid foundation in 306 is gonna build uh, all kinds of tools that you need for all of the stuff that comes after this, whether it's directly after this or in all the other upper division classes. This is where I learned how to prove things, it's this class. And that's the emphasis I want us to have. As we do this. Um, what else do I wanna say about this? As far as the structure of the class goes, um, the right now I have the homework. So this the way I've got the grading for the class set up. I want to make sure that the homework has uh, uh, the labor in this class. The, the the execution of the homework is really important, and I haven't settled on my final percent distribution yet. But right now it's twenty percent of the grade is the homework, and the other eighty percent is spread out between exams. But I may actually adjust more towards homework because specifically that the work in this class is where you learn things. I learn a lot more about how you're doing in here. You're going to get more from this class by spending time on the homework as opposed to whatever I can extract from you in an hour long exam, where 
just by the virtue of the fact that it's in 50 minutes, I have to ask you simpler questions. Okay? So I want to prioritize like the work in here and the writing in here. Okay? And the problems will be chosen for that. Um, what else do I want to say about that? Right. Other than that, uh, I mean, it's pretty standard. You're going to assign homework every week up on the Canvas page already. You should see I've got a course calendar up there. The homework will be posted. It will be due every week. Uh, I'm thinking Tuesday is a good day to pick it up so that we have time to talk on Monday. If you guys haven't finished it, it gives you the weekends to work through things. So I'll be assigning it on uh, Monday or Tuesday and picking it up the following Tuesday um, where it will, I've got a grader, so it should come back the following week. Um, I'm gonna put an emphasis on the way that you've written the solutions as well as the mathematics of the solutions. Because again, I wanna put an emphasis on your proof writing. Um, and then there'll be additional problems as well for those of you that are uh, interested in going further than I can go in the class. There'll be some really interesting, I think interesting challenge questions that aren't required, but they, they're good extensions. Um, what else do I wanna ask about? Yep. Um, is homework being submitted online? Or homework will be submitted in person. Um, it's actually, it's not a, as much as possible, I, I wanna try to run this class in a, a physically. And I think that, adding an extra layer. Now, you're welcome to, if, if there's anybody here who wants to LaTeX their, their, their work, you're welcome to do so, and I, I can actually assist with that. I see some head shaking going on with, uh, with, uh, with response to the LaTeXing, but you don't have to. And the reason I, I want to do physical homework is because adding a scanning layer to the collection and assignment of homework actually is it's friction, I think, so. Are you okay with writing on the tablet? Absolutely, yep. And actually, it's, it's uh, I don't actually, unless it's going to turn into like the entire class, I don't really mind if homework gets submitted by PDF. It's just, I have, I have to be able to hand it off to the grader. So if you're going to put it on a tablet, it would be best if you would print it out from that point. Okay. Any other structural questions I can answer right now? Yep. Is homework graded on Compass or? Uh, homework will mostly be graded on Compass. There's a two components to the homework, right? Uh, not all the questions can be graded because there's not enough time for it. So I'm going to, I'm going to assign, I'm going to grade, um, did you do all the work? And then there'll be one or two questions that are pulled out for a lot of attention to like what the argument was like and how the writing was done. So completeness is most of it. And then there'll be a problem where I'm assessing you on what your proof writing was like. So uh, in order not to keep uh, Chandra deep here, I'm going to add that there's a workshop for this class. I'm gonna invite him up here to speak about the workshop. Um, I encourage you guys to participate if you have time to do it. So please, go ahead. Yeah, so the workshops offer like really good support for classes like this because um, one question that I got that I got was, is it going to be okay to talk about homework in there? And the answer is yes. I want you guys to be able to discuss these things, right? Both the proof writing and the concepts themselves. So it's like a it's like a, a formal support uh, for the class if you've never done a workshop before. Um, it is required, I believe. You have to enroll in it. It has required attendance. If it's anything like it's like the calculus classes, is attendance required? Um, yeah. Sure. Okay. But especially if you uh, if you're worried that like this is this class is going to be a big lift or it's been a while since you thought about linear algebra, I would absolutely um, I, I I was a workshop facilitator and participant when I was a student here, although it was a long time ago. But it's a, it's a really cool program. Um, it's going to be supported on the uh, I think we're going to be running a piece of the Slack channel that will be dedicated to that. So it's an organizational tool. So yeah, uh, if you are interested. Um, Feel free to like. I'll make a post on the on the Canvas page. And you'll be just be able to contact uh, talk to you at the times that you're available, and uh, and we'll go from there. Any other questions about anything about the way the course is structured? Okay, so um, right. So the last thing I want to say here is that um, this when you're I I have to, what I want you specifically to keep in mind when you're writing your arguments in this class is that 
you should come, one, you should come and talk to me in my office hours if you have trouble uh, understanding the concept of what's going on, because the definitional concepts are going to underlie your understanding of the rest of the class. The second thing is, and I already erased it, um, please, my, my office hours tend to be, uh, at least when students aren't completely crushed with other things to do, they tend to be well attended. Right now, I'm thinking I'm going to have time on Monday, Wednesday, sometime in the morning or early afternoon. And then I'm going to add another office hour as well. So right now, I'm thinking 11 to 12. Um, and then maybe some other time or definitely some other time on Tuesday, Thursday, or Friday. Also, the Slack channel. This is the sort of math that's going to require that you don't wait until the last minute and try to crunch it out in one night, or you're going to get overwhelmed by it. Right, it needs time. You have to think about it a little bit every day. If you've got questions about the, what's going on with the concept, talk to me about it so we can have a conversation. Okay, I would encourage you actually, if you do contact me in the Slack channel, if you have a question that you think is too embarrassing to put in the Slack channel because it's too, you know, oh, it's too dumb, I can't ask that question, just ask it in the public channel. Like everyone else, if you have a question, lots of other people have the channel or have the question as well. Okay? And then everybody will get a chance to, to look at the responses of that conversation. Um, yeah, so don't wait, don't wait. Come talk to me, make sure you stay engaged in the class. Um, and uh, to the extent that I can, I'll be putting tons, I, you know, I tend to put lots of stuff up on Canvas. So if I get a lot of questions about things, I like to have things up there. Okay. All right, so anything else? Okay, so let's do that. All right, let's do it. So we're going to start some basic ideas here in my attempt to convince you that everything in the universe is secretly linear algebra. Okay. So the first thing is, and this refers, I'll try as much as possible to refer to the sections of the book. Um, that we're talking about. So this is chapter 1a. And so where we're going to start with linear algebra, perhaps unlike in your earlier courses, is we're mostly going to be doing linear algebra over the complex numbers. And the reason is because complex numbers are way nicer than real numbers in a lot of ways. So we're going to work over C, which are the complex numbers. It's C. All numbers of form A plus IB, where A and B are real. Okay, so one of the things that I want you to know about why I'm starting a class like this is I'm trying to get you used to the notation that we're going to be using. So then I'm not just dropping you in deep end. So simple concept, maybe new notation. Okay. So the complex numbers are the set of numbers of the form A plus IB, where A and B are in the reals. And I is defined, it's the symbol, curse Gauss for ever naming it the imaginary unit. And it's the symbol that we use to stand for the square root of minus one. And really the relation that we care about with I is not this, it's the fact that I squared negative one. So we actually think, of R as living inside C. So mathematicians tend to think of the complex numbers as this. So when a mathematician thinks of the complex numbers, they think of a real axis and an imaginary axis. So we think of R as being the set of numbers A plus I times zero where A is a real number. It's a natural way of thinking about the real numbers is living inside the complex numbers. So the real numbers are sort of naturally included inside here. Now, with complex numbers, we get, uh, so as many things, we take an idea in, in mathematics and we generalize it. What we're trying to do is we're trying to keep structure that we already know and are used to, but extend it to new symbols. So 
the complex numbers would be useless if arithmetic didn't work. So arithmetic still works. Which of course this means means that algebra is going to work. I should point out that if you guys, if I say anything, say anything or write anything that you don't understand or seems like a lie or I'm waving my hands and covering something up, please feel free to raise your hand and challenge me on stuff, okay? Okay. The only, com the only complicated, uh, just as a, an example here, the way that you add complex numbers is in the obvious way. You just use the rules of algebra. Okay. So this is, you can think about the addition that we are defining here. Make sure that we start with a complex number and we end with a complex number, right? These operations are what are called closed. We start with two complex numbers, I produce a new complex number. And this is the form we want because this number right here is like the real part of the number. And this over here is stuck onto the I as the imaginary part of the number. The two that deserve a slightly closer look, these. So the multiplication of complex numbers, probably most of you have seen before. If you use the distributive property, you get AC and then an IAD and an IBC, but then there's an I squared EB. Of course, I squared is negative one. So you get AC minus BD plus I times BD plus B. So that is how multiplication is defined. You should not memorize this. You should just remember that you can do it. Okay, so the idea here is because I squared was negative one, we just turned it into a negative one. So therefore multiplication of complex numbers produces another complex number. Now, for those of you that have, uh, that, have, that have thought about complex numbers before, as this picture where they are vectors in R2, this should strike you as really weird because this is a multiplication of two objects that we think about vectors that produces another vector in the same plane. It's not a cross product, it's not a dot product. Most people, when they think about A plus IB, they think about it like this. This arrow is that complex number. So the complex numbers have this weird structure where they act kind of like vectors, except I can actually multiply them. It's an oddity of the structure. Even weirder, this makes sense. One over Z is a thing that makes sense in complex numbers. Right? But this Sort of uh, multiplicative inverse. Makes sense for complex numbers, which, you know, as a vector, thinking about it as in the vector picture, that really doesn't make any sense at all. Um, I'm going to leave this. I'm not actually going to tell you what 1 over z is if z is equal to a plus ib, then 1 over z is equal to. Because it's exercise one in the homework to actually compute what one over z is. But the idea here is that the complex numbers give us an arithmetically consistent and closed system of numbers. Complex numbers are arithmetically consistent. They're closed under the regular operations. So then the question becomes, why do we use them? Like what, what's the point of complex numbers? I'm actually curious. Does anybody know why? What, what is the purpose of complex numbers? What motivates all of the effort and the 8,000 times you've seen this introduction to complex numbers in the past? Yep. Um, can it be used like as an ordinary step, like between things? What do you mean? Like Sometimes, at least with the that like e to the pi i equation, when you're like, or it's like the sine. I'm not sure exactly what it is. Sure. Um, when you're like doing steps in that, sometimes you get like complex numbers, but then they like 
kind of dissolved by Okay, the so computational efficiency when you're dealing with things like e to the x or e to the yeah. i x, right? Yeah, that is that is a reason that that's not that's a that's a happy accident that that turns out to be true. What is the mathematically imperative reason why? Any guesses? Yep. Uh, finding the roots of functions. How? Okay. Like, what do you mean? Zeros of. Uh, Perfect, but like, can you be more specific? Like, if you include complex numbers, then you'll have a full set of zeros, I guess you could say. So I'm going to write a polynomial down. That's just to your point. Okay, so there's a polynomial, right? Now I'm using Z here because I'm trying to emphasize this is a polynomial of complex numbers. If you deal with this in real numbers, if you've ever had this, like, say, like, imagine, like, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to traumatize you like this, but I want you to imagine you're learning the theory of partial fractions in calculus two for a second, right? That in, when you do partial fractions uh, in, in calculus two, you constantly are dealing with these, like, in these irreducible quadratic terms in a rational expansion, right? Or they're all over the place. Things like one over x squared plus one, you have to use inverse trig substitution to work with. So you deal with things like this, let's put a Z here, and you get this, which in the past you've probably seen referred to as an irreducible quadratic. All of this is trying to motivate why complex instead of real numbers. Um, well, it's irreducible. What they didn't tell you when they taught you irreducible quadratic was really secretly there was more words here that they left out. Irreducible quadratic over the reals means I can't factor that any further if I restrict myself to real numbers. If I'm allowed to use complex numbers, I can keep factoring. Every polynomial factors into linear terms if I'm allowed to use complex numbers. In fact, that idea is so important that it has a fancy name, which is, anybody? Anybody seen this before in a previous class? I mean, the idea that every polynomial factors into linear terms, we're going to be using this fact in this class. Does anybody know what that's called? So that's called the fundamental theorem of algebra. And all by itself, that's enough to justify using the complex number. Let's see. Every polynomial factors. It's a linear term. Now you might think, okay, well, what business does that have in a linear algebra class? Right? Besides the fact that it has algebra in the name. So one thing you might remember from 206 or your previous linear algebra class that motivates from the very beginning that we're going to be working over the complex numbers in many cases is if you recall what the characteristic polynomial was for finding eigenvalues or the eigenvalue equation, that involved factoring a polynomial. And oftentimes that polynomial had complex roots. So we were sort of pretending that we were dealing with real valued entries all through 206. We pretend everything is real, but then secretly in the background, it was all complex analysis. We just covered it up. Okay. So we're going to make that express in here almost always. Linear algebra is nicer. Over C. I guess I should say here, just so you've seen it before, this is called the fundamental theorem of algebra. And it's actually proved if you guys ever take 408, uh, which is complex analysis, you prove it in there. <laughs> so it's actually a theorem of complex analysis that a real polynomial factors down into, um, into uh, linear terms. Uniquely in the linear terms. What do you mean by real polynomial? Uh, I mean a polynomial with real coefficients. So when I refer to a polynomial in C, what I really mean is um, a polynomial uh, over C is of the form AI VI, I runs from say zero to K. And each of the AI are the coefficients come from the complex numbers. 
right? So in most of our earlier calculus classes, we treat polynomials that have real coefficients, but to really work with them, we cheat and say, oh, well, we'll just factor. And then every time we factor, the roots always appear in conjugate pairs, right? As you've seen this before, we do like, oh, complex roots always occur, occur in conjugate pairs. That only happens when you let polynomials have real entries. So we're going to sort of expand, like a part of this, a big part of this class is sort of expanding our vision. And one way to expand our vision is to think of polynomials not as just necessarily having real numbers as coefficients, but complex numbers as well. Polynomials turn out to be one of the big examples of uh, the sort of vector spaces that we're going to be looking at. So polynomials with complex uh, coefficients are all factorable? Yes. A polynomial with complex, in fact, a polynomial with real coefficients has the same has the same property. It's just you have to admit complex roots to do it, right? Any polynomial, I mean, remember the real numbers are complex numbers. So to say that this is true over C implies the same theorem over R. Okay. All right, so here's a question I'm really curious about. What is... Uh, Sorry, for a second there, I was, uh, I was thinking about the wrong class. That's these notes, vector analysis. These notes are for this class. What is a, uh, what's a vector? What's a vector? You guys have taken, I mean, I don't know how many times in your life you've been introduced to the idea of what a vector is, but it's a lot, right? How many, you know, you've seen this a lot in your life. Stuart does it. He saw it in 206. I'm curious, though. Like, so I gotta write that down. What is a vector? A point with a direction. Okay, so there's one answer. Anything else? Yep. Okay, a line from the origin with magnitude and direction. Anybody else have a stab on what a vector is? I'm not saying these are wrong, by the way. But is there any other ideas here? Sequence of numbers. All right, so we're going to come back to this word sequence. Anything else? My answer is probably going to disappoint you. So everything that was said here is basically true, except these are vectors in Fn, now there's a fancy symbol, math VBF. What I mean by Fn here, every time in this class I write Fn down, I mean n dimensional C or n dimensional R. This is called Euclidean space. That definition of vectors is where the idea of vectors came from and what it's supposed to emulate. But these are specifically these vectors. At this point in your life, probably the only vectors you've spent a lot of time dealing with knowingly were vectors that lived here. So basically everything that you guys have said, if we have Rn, I mean the space of lists now, um, x1, x2, up to xn, uh, Xn is an element of R, right? That is Rn. XYZ in case of R3. And Cn is the same thing, except it's complex numbers. Okay. It turns out to be the case. That generally, when we say what a vector is, this is such an irritating answer. And I'm sorry I'm going to give it. A vector is a member of a vector space. 
How's that for a non committal definition? If it's in a vector space, it's a vector. Okay. So, where this class really begins is in that question What does it mean to be a vector space? All of these ideas here are beautiful ideas the idea of direction, the idea of magnitude. The idea that you have this sequence. So this is what Axler is going to call a list, which I'll define in a second. But this sequence of coordinates to describe what the vector is, these are the classical vectors. Right? This is where the entire idea of linear algebra is born. And if you took math 206, this is all you think probably linear algebra is if you've not seen it in a different class. Okay. So Axler is going to make the following definition. He's going to say a list is an ordered collection of n numbers. One, now, when we're dealing with a book like Axler, it's important that we get our definitions precise because he's going to be precise about the way he uses this. When he says a list of numbers, he means a finite collection. That's a beginning and an end. So a list finite. And a list is not a set. I use this notation instead of set notation because it's not a set. If I had a set, I can't repeat elements, right? As a set, things that repeat uh, collapse. As a set, something like four, four is the same as the set four. Sets, sets don't see repetition of elements, but lists do. Lists are going to be the backbone that we use to fill vector spaces next. Final thing he says about lists is lists are the same or equal. Lists are equal if the entries are equal. So if xi is equal to yi, i equals one to n, then the list x1 xn is equal to the list y1 to y1. What he's doing here is he's building up the conceptual background to make this thing rigorous. This idea of coordinates rigorous is where he's going with this. So he's building formally what it means to be coordinate. Order matters because your x coordinate and your y coordinate can't switch places without changing the point. Repetition is okay because I want to be able to repeat coordinates. And at least for most of this class, everything we're going to be dealing with is finite dimensional. All right. So why, uh, why isn't this good enough? Or like, what can we extract from this? The general move of mathematics is to look at things that are nice and try to figure out what is nice about them that we should keep and what we can get rid of. So the behavior, let's just say that we're working on Fn here. Fn has nice algebra. What I mean is, if I took an element x and I add it to an element y, that's a well-defined operation that's really easy to understand. If I take two elements from R and C in and I add them together, the way that I do it Is I write the two lists down and I just add entry wise, right? I start with two vectors in the space and I have this operation that produces a new vector in the space. It's one of the core features of CN or RN is that I can add vectors entry wise. Another core feature of RN or CN 
so that I can multiply by a skewer. Oh, I have, say, X, which lives inside of Fn. And I have alpha, okay, not, let's not do alpha, yeah, let's do A, which lives inside the field. Okay, this is a scalar. Scalar is a number. This is, I'm mean, trying to get access notation as much as possible here. A is in the field, and in F, C, it's F, F is either a real or complex number. X is a vector of n dimensions. Then we define a multiplication by A, X is A times X1, Xn, which is a x one up to a x. Again, I start with a vector and any scalar, and I get back a vector in the same space, the same set. I started with a vector in F n. I end with a vector in F n. So, the mathematical way of describing what's happening here is that this addition is closed. Addition. And scalar multiplication are closed. That's one of the properties they have. I feed in vectors, I get a vector out of the same type. I don't suddenly produce new coordinates. I have operations that eat vectors and produce a vector. This one eats a scalar and a vector and it produces a vector. More than that, I have all these totally awesome. Arithmetic properties. I'll just write one down. What's this one called? A distributive property, right? It just comes from the fact that we have these lists of numbers. It's very easy to manipulate, right? Inside the list, everything is in this entry or this entry or this entry. The fact that I can do this distribution comes from the fact that I have this entry wise definitions. Okay, so one note, by the way. Unlike, you guys all take your linear algebra out of lay, so the textbook, mm -hmm. most people do like, so unlike lay, for example, Axler does not typographically distinguish Vectors and scalars. No boldface, no arrows, no nothing. You have to do that from context. So he's going to use conventions to try to suggest to you what's going on here. So he's going to use the letters A, B, and C to refer to scalars and X, Y, and Z, X, Y, and W usually to refer to vectors. Okay. But the reason that we're doing this is because. He trusts you. He trusts that you're going to be able to look at a statement and figure out what, it, what interpretation it needs to be given in order for it to make sense. So as written, of course, A cannot possibly be a vector because vectors don't multiply like this. Okay? There's no dot product or cross product or anything being invoked here. This statement only makes sense if, uh, at least in Axler's sort of approach to this, if these are vectors and that's a scalar. So I'm trying to be, again, it's consistency with the text. Right. He doesn't distinguish. You are not required to. So you feel free as long as you're consistent about the way that you're approaching your scalars and your vectors. So where we're going to go and where we're really going to start the class next time, this is just sort of an introduction to the um, the way we're thinking about it. Is we want to be able to take this idea, the idea of having lists of numbers. And, uh, and build them up, keep the structure of arithmetic. So we're gonna keep the idea of scalar multiplication and we wanna keep the idea of vector addition, but we don't wanna restrict ourselves. We wanna keep scalar multiplication 
And when I keep vector addition, but we don't want to restrict ourselves. To lists of numbers being equal to vectors. That's really the big idea here. I want the structure of scalar multiplication and vector addition, but I don't want to have to just say all that a vector is is a list of coordinates. In fact, you guys have seen lots of vectors in the past. <laughs> just to give you an idea of like, what are our first big objects of study? I'm not going to define abstract vector spaces because that's the beginning. Yep. What is that? We don't want to restrict. Ourselves. Oh, I'm sorry. Ourselves. Yeah, I'm, my bad. Yeah, I, if I get excited, uh, and I, I do because I like this math, I'll start writing too fast. If I write something incomprehensible up here, stop me. Okay, I don't mean to. Writing with chalk is hard, especially when you get deeper. Okay, so for example, I want you to think for a second about if you had a polynomial that looked like this. Let's call this A1, B1, C1, and A2, B2, C2. Does it make sense to add those? Sure. How did they add? Well, F plus G is A1 plus A2 plus B1 plus B2X plus C1 plus C2X squared. So there's a, you can add these polynomials together and get another polynomial of the same degree out the other side, right? This is a degree two polynomial. This is a degree two polynomial. If you just use the addition of polynomials and collect like terms, you get this. Well, that's an addition. We started with two things, we added them together, we got another object of the same type out the other side. Lay loves this example, so probably you guys have seen this before, but this is our launching point. A of F, a different option, like K. K times F, scalar multiplication, well that's just K times A1 plus B1X plus C1X squared. That makes sense because I can just distribute this inside to get K1, A, A1 plus A, A2, uh, B1X plus K, C1, X squared. So again, it makes sense to take a scalar, some number, and multiply it in by this polynomial, and I get another polynomial out of the same degree again. So polynomials are vectors, and they can be thought of as vectors if you tell me what the operations are. These are objects that we're going to consider as vectors. I can add them using this type of addition, and I get another object of the same type back out. I can multiply a polynomial times a scalar to get a scalar multiplication, and I get another object of the same type back out. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say what rules of addition need to hold in order for these objects to act like Rn and Cn. Right? That's really what we're after. What do we need to be able to say about how vectors act so that the algebra of the vectors looks like we're just working in regular world RN? All right, before I close down for the day here, we'll do some proof tech time. Any uh, any questions about any of this stuff? Raise up the class. Yep. Um, the functions have to really, uh, do they have to have the same number of terms? So, okay, that's an excellent question. So there is a vector space of degree two polynomials, right? Where I can combine them that way. But there's actually this infinite dimensional monstrosity called the vector space of all polynomials, in which case you can add any polynomial to any other polynomial you want, and you still get a polynomial back up the other side. Okay. So there's this entire relationship between huge spaces and their restrictions to smaller pieces like this that we're going to be talking about. All right, guys.